survey from the U.S. Census in 2019 showed that the average American household owned six and one half etude books that are largely going unused. So today, let's talk about the what and how to practice with etudes, and I've got a free etude you're going to enjoy working on. Hi, and welcome to the Saxophone Academy. I'm Dr. Wally Wallace, and if you're interested in saxophone masterclasses and product reviews, please do consider subscribing and do hit the like button for free etudes. Also, in the comments below, let me know what is your favorite etude book or what has tortured you as a child? Do you love the knee house? Do you love the fairlings? Sicko? Well, today I've got an etude written by my mentor, Chad Eby. It's over a blues in the style of my hero, West Coast saxophonist, Bud Shank. You can download it uh, below in the link and follow along today. But what we're going to do is go through the etude and talk about four out of possibly many concepts that we should focus in on when working in etudes. And we'll show you in context how to practice these concepts. So first things first, let's listen through once in its entirety so you can hear what we're learning together. Step one, eat that frog. Now, that is a phrase attributed to Mark Twain, that if you eat a live frog in the morning, the rest of your day is going to inevitably get better. Paraphrasing, adopted by business and self-help gurus about procrastination, meaning if you have to eat a live frog, just go ahead and get it out of the way, and then the rest of your day will be much better and more productive. So in the context of an etude, let's take a look at the double time, the things that many of my students tend to put off when learning an etude. So take a listen to the double time phrase in this etude. Now it's actually in the second to last phrase of the etude, which means many students practice line by line by line by line, which meaning by the time they get to their lesson or performance, it's something they've looked at last and is least comfortable. So let's zero in on it first things first, and start to make it ingrained at the beginning of our practice session when we first start learning the etude. We're going to eat that double time frog. It's not a phrase that I ever expected to hear myself say. So first things, when we start to practice double time, we're obviously going to slow it down for technique, but let's slow it down once so we can clearly clear the pitches. You cannot play it cleanly and convincingly if you can't hear it in your mind's ear. Audiation, I think, is the term for it. So once it's in our ears and feels relaxed at a slow tempo, we've sped up the process here for the sake of this video. We start to break it down into its component beat groupings. And here we have a group of four and two pickup notes. So let's work on the beat grouping four, always landing on the next beat first. Play it through several times, work it up with your metronome. And then what I like to do is close my eyes have it memorized and play through several times without looking at the music. And it's just five notes. Most of us can memorize fairly quickly. That's going to help a lot in the learning process. <laughs> Now, once you're comfortable with that four note grouping leading to the next beat, we practice the pickups, but we practice them in a way that we hear them as pickups rather than six notes kind of blurring together. We hear them very clearly and a two and a two and a two. So we hear them as pickups and we know where the next rung of the ladder. So practice the pickups, but make sure we're practicing in a way where it feels like the and a two. We feel them as pickups. <laughs> Then put them both together. Obviously, you'll need to practice slowly to faster with your metronome. 
do it faster and faster, then put it in context. If you can't play it in context, you can't play it. So if you can isolate it, you have to play it 10 times before you can play it. But then when you put it in context, it's not there. It's not there. Slow it down and take more time with it. Music is not a race, thankfully. <laughs> Concept two, let's talk articulation. Now, articulation is not just tonguing or not tonguing. A common misconception, and I've been guilty of teaching this to beginning band students as well, is that tonguing is binary. Either we tongue the note or we don't, and that's it. No, it's a vast spectrum of sounds, style, inflection, accent, ghosting. Uh, articulation doesn't just mean the tongue. We start many notes with air, but it also refers to how we end the note, which there are myriad ways to do that as well. So let's take a look at the phrase starting in measure seven. Uh, it's a great example with many different patterns of beat groupings, accents, and ghosting opportunities. We have groups of two and three. So let's take a listen to this phrase and we'll work on the articulation, style, and inflection. But take a listen. <laughs> So next, what I like to have my students do is play through that phrase again, but take away any articulation, just slur it slowly, getting the technique. And also when we slur something, it removes any possibility of hiding inefficient technique. Because sometimes when we add a gap between a tongue or an accent, we're gonna have an inefficiency of finger technique. So slurring the technique once through first is a great idea. So play it slurred, hear the phrase where it's going without breaking the airstream. <laughs> Then break it up into chunks. Look at where the slurs are marked, how the beat groupings work together, practice them individually, then start to put them together. Keep adding chunks until you have the entirety of the phrase and start to pay attention to where the accents are happening. Take a look at the G at the end of the phrase. I wasn't pleased with the way the G was coming out, that accent. So I might slow it down and work on ghosting the note preceding the G because accent is not only hitting that note harder with air, not tongue. Accents are air, not tongue, but also the note preceding it. If we ghost that one slightly, let the air relax then it brings out the accent. So I might practice just working on that goal note of that G accent. <laughs> So another great opportunity to work on articulation is in the last line of the etude where we start to articulate the palm keys. Can be a problem spot for a lot of students. So let's take a listen to this phrase once. Now, if we're not careful when we articulate those palm keys or higher, they can sound harsh, pinched, or just choke, like a nervous kid in a spelling bee, I guess. I've never done a spelling bee. I, I was never asked. I think it would have been really cute in a little sweater vest and a little bow tie, and I think I could have, I think I could have done well. No one asked. What were we talking about? Oh, yes, articulation. We have to remain Relax. So a great method of doing this is slurring from the lower note up to the high note. But first, let's play this grouping slurred. Then what we're going to do is slur from the lower note to the high note without changing our embouchure, letting the air do the work. Repeat that several times, slurring back and forth between the two intervals, keeping the embouchure relaxed as if we are always playing the lower note.
And remember, accents are created by air, not tongue. The tongue releases the reed, allowing the air to make it vibrate. We want to hear the accent as air, not the tongue. Keeping the embouchure relaxed, letting the air do the work is critical in getting good accented notes, especially up in the palm keys. Now, next up, let's talk about phrasing. Take a look at measure 13. We have a long phrase that could sound like a beautiful, luxurious melodic line. But if we're not careful, it could be a hobbled travesty that sounds more like... Now, I've obviously exaggerated, only slightly sometimes, of what students might end up doing, creating a stuttering motion that doesn't carry through the melodic line, because they're not looking at the goal of where the phrase is going. So pulling back and looking more like a general than a foot soldier, we see that the line starts on C sharp three and leads all the way to D three much later. One continuous melodic line. And remember, you can tongue every place where it's meant to be tongued, you can do that every time and still not make the phrase work. You can win every battle, but still lose the war, which is why we need to think like generals looking at the big picture of where the line is going. So first step I have my students do is get the articulation out of the way and just create a slurred melodic line so they can hear melodically the scaffolding underneath of what's going on, the C sharp crescendoing up to the D. So try it slurred first. Then we add back in the articulation without backing off the airstream, the overall air velocity leading to that note. And we should have a much more connected, beautiful melodic line when we do that. Now the coup de gras of this phrase, the little fun glissando at the end. I don't practice that every time I practice the phrase because that's like a little fun tag ending. We want to get the overall basic scaffolding of the phrase first, then we add the fun stuff later. So don't get hung up on the little glissando down. So to practice that, we simply do a quick chromatic run down to the goal note, practice the glissando down to the goal note first several times. And then we add the accented offbeat, completing the entire phrase. Now, the last concept that we're going to talk about today, and there are many, many more we need to work on with general technique, intonation, tone quality, many things we need to address in an etude, but here are four things to think about today. The final one I want to think about is application, homework, if you will. So we don't want to just learn an etude for the sake of learning an etude. If it's well written, like this one is written by my mentor, Chad Eby, there's beautiful language in here that's adapted and part of the oral tradition from the master. So what I might do when I'm working on an etude is, is anything jump out and grab my ear while I'm playing. <laughs> And right there, my ears perk up because I hear a, a phrase that I've heard before, that sound. I know I've heard it elsewhere. I always kind of dig it, but I don't inherently know it. So what I might do is play it and then get it in my ear a couple times. and then analyze it by scale degree. It's not about the individual notes. It's not terribly useful if we think of a phrase as B, D, E, F, B, because that only applies to, you know, one key area, but think of it as three, five, six, flat seven, one. And it's a beautiful little kind of melodic cell there that works over major, dominant, because remember, we don't have to match every note within a chord, but it's a beautiful little phrase that we can then apply to different key areas. But first, play it several times, get it in your ear, and think of it as three, five, six, flat seven, three. Three. 
then move it to a, another key area, preferably one that's in this etude. So the first time we see this pattern, or the only time rather we see this pattern in this etude, it's over the four chord, the area of G major. So then I might try to apply that same three, five, six, flat seven, three over the one chord, put it in D major. <laughs> And of course, always have fun with it, alter it, use octave displacement, and change the rhythms. We are learning to improvise here, after all. And then I might put it in context of the chord changes. Try that pattern, alter, displace, as the chord changes of the full 12-bar blues go by and see what happens. <laughs> So these are just four of endless concepts we should be addressing when learning an etude. And here's the thing, as you learn etudes, you'll be looking at different things throughout your playing career. Let's put career in quotes. Throughout this beautiful learning of music, we're not just gonna be learning etudes to be done with it. I revisit etudes all the time and I'm a different person when I go back. Identity theft, but also growth as a musician. So these are four concepts Think about it when you apply it to your next etude. And again, in the comments below, let me know which etudes you love working on, which ones you hate working on, or what you would like to see in etudes. I will see you very soon. And in the meantime, go practice this great etude. <laughs>